Thank you very much, Danielle. Can you all hear me? Great. Are you awake? About 30% are awake, I think. Wow. All right. Well, we're going to try to wake you up a little bit. Uh, thank you, Danielle. That was quite the, uh, that was the short version of my bio. Yeah, it's just really difficult. To... <laughs> but anyway, um, really great to be here in Alberta. I just want to give you a tiny bit of background as it relates to my experience here in Alberta. Uh, I moved to Canada 10 years ago and landed here in Calgary almost exactly uh, to the month uh, 10 years ago. And um, I came here to publish a book of interviews on the future of the oil and gas industry. Um, I uh, met a lot of great people. Colea was one of them uh, at the time. Uh, of course, uh, she, uh, well, the Canadian Blockchain Consortium didn't exist. Uh, she was, of course, already, uh, you know, a fearless uh, leader. So I'm uh, not surprised to see, uh, you know, how far she has come today. Um, but, um, of course, at the time, the, uh, you know, when we talked about tech, it was mostly industrial tech. It was mostly related to making the oil and gas industry more efficient, uh, more sustainable. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, later on, we started talking more about AI, and today uh, we're talking about blockchain, and this conference is a, a great example of how far we've come. Uh, so super, super excited to be here today. Um, what I would also say is uh, that uh, I think uh, the, the blockchain industry and tech in general has come a long way too, and today I don't think we're really talking anymore about an emergence, but we're really talking about growth uh, of this industry, and uh, this is pretty much what this panel is about. Um, so the topic of the panel is financing alternatives in the digital age, a discussion of internet-based fundraising, policy, and regulatory considerations. And they and, will be doing all the work on that. And before Florent gets going, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we found a male's wedding ring in the uh, washroom upstairs. Just wanted to make sure that somebody didn't leave or their wife would be uh, giving them trouble. So just come down and see me if this is yours. I lost my wedding ring once, so... <laughs> no, no, not this time. <laughs> Anyway, um, so the topics of the conversation today, I mean, obviously, when you want to grow, you usually need capital. So this is, a, a, you know, an essential piece of this uh, event and this conversation. Uh, we all know that the crypto and blockchain industry is uh, growing very fast, uh, altering all sorts of industries, including the private uh, equity sector. So some of the questions we're going to be looking at are around security to uh, token offerings, uh, how they differ from traditional capital raising uh, activities such as IPOs, um, what are the risks, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm going to introduce my panel so we can get into it uh, as soon as possible. So um, I've given them nicknames, by the way, so we sort of have the entrepreneur, the not-for-profit leader, the lawyer, and the regulator. Uh, so I'm going to start with the entrepreneur, Kuram uh, Shroff, who I met recently on LinkedIn. Very nice to have you here. He's the chairman and chief executive officer of iMining Technologies. I think you've come across that name a few times in the last few days. Um, he is really an early adopter and champion of blockchain technology. He's been involved in various activities uh, within the sector since 2010, which of course is a lifetime in this industry. Uh, through his family investment office, he has invested in multiple blockchain solutions and protocols. He was also instrumental uh, in the launch of Ethereum 2.0. Um, and um, he is also an award-winning global banking and finance leader. He has been featured in the prestigious list of the top 100 most powerful and influential Muslims in the world by Power 100. So congrats for that. And his fun fact, since we're doing fun facts, is that he is one of the oldest miners in the world. And when you say it like that, you wouldn't tell, right? Uh, anyway. Um, next is... Um, Mark Courthouse, um, you know him a little bit already by now, President and Chief, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. Um, the, uh, the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital is the largest freestanding rehabilitation hospital in North America, containing seven specialized areas of treatment, orthopedic, geriatrics, pediatrics, stroke, brain injury, et cetera, et cetera. Prior to his role, he spent five years as the President and CEO of the Alberta Mental Health Foundation. He has a podcast about mental health. We can probably all use a little bit of uh, sort of know-how in that area after the last two years. Uh, it's called Confronting the Madness, Exploring the Psychological Issues of Our Time. So check it out. Um, and his fun fact is that he's been uh, part of two soccer pro teams here in Calgary about 10 years ago. And I did a bit of research and both of them went uh, defunct in the following years. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, next is uh, Laurie Stein. Laurie is a partner at McCarthy Tetro. Uh, Tetro. Um, Laurie Stein is also the co-head of the uh, firm's fintech group and a partner in the firm's business law group. 
specifically uh, the Securities Regulatory and Investment Products Group. Lots of groups. Uh, <laughs> uh, in Toronto, uh, she advises fintech businesses, portfolio managers, dealers, investment funds, uh, investment managers, institu institutional investors on all aspects of Canadian securities regulation. She's at the forefront of the fast-paced digital asset space, guiding clients on how to manage legal and regulatory risks associated with crypto assets and blockchain infrastructure. And I'm going to take my breath. She has two sons, that's her fun fact, and they received Bitcoin and ETH from the Tooth Fairy uh, some years ago and um, instead of cash, and the uh, return on that was 400%. Uh, so I said, I hope she put a, she gave them a lot of money that year because uh, great investment. And finally, we have um, our regulator, Tonya Fleming, who's manager of innovation and financial technology at the Alberta Securities Commission. Tonya is the uh, manager of innovation within the corporate finance team at the Alberta Securities Commission. Okay, this is the new team. Uh, uh, this is a new team, sorry, at the AAC who will work with small and innovative businesses in the province to assist them in raising capital. Super important, of course. Tonya's background is uh, as a traditional corporate securities lawyer. She is new to navigating the crypto space. And her fun fact is she told me to let you know that although she's new at nav navigating this space, she has been in the canine research and, uh, sorry, search and rescue team at the University of Alberta, uh, rescuing uh, children uh, on various missions in Alberta and uh, the Northwest Territories. I don't know what the correlation exactly is, but something about navigation, I think. So, um, maybe a round of applause for the uh, speakers to cheer them on a bit. Thank you very much. So, um, the first question is around Bill 13, also called the Financial Innovation Act. And I'm going to start with you, Karam. Um, what are some of the opportunities for entrepreneurs in our industry? What are some of the legal implications? Although we'll move to your colleagues for that. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's really an honor uh, being here. And it's even uh, additional honor. And um, I think this is probably one of the most esteemed uh, panels here today. And it's one of the most important panels. And um, I really compliment uh, the regulator for the Alberta Securities Commission because that's uh, uh, one of the forward-looking regulators I believe exist in the world. So Albert is very lucky. Uh, to have regulators who are thinking like this, right? And um, I believe this opens up opportunity, legislation opens up opportunity for uh, companies to look at Alberta as a possible jurisdiction to expand in or relocate to. So I think this is a starting point and I think you guys are part of making history because there's, I've met a lot of regulators and a lot of jurisdictions around the world we're sitting in a possibly the most growth-oriented uh, uh, legislative economy in the world today. Thank you. I'm maybe going to turn some, to some of the legal and regulation folks out there. Um, I think, Tanya, maybe you would want to yeah, take it on? Yeah, thank you. Th and thank you, Karim. That's uh, nice of you to say. Um, the innovation team at the ASC is new, and I am new to the crypto space, so this is a, this conference has just been incredible for me in terms of learning and meeting people. Um, but I I'm here with a few of my colleagues who have tremendous background and knowledge um, and rely very heavily on them. Um, part of what we'll do in the innovation group at the ASC is bring people in uh, who want to do, th want to raise capital in a compliant way uh, and need an introduction to the right people at the ASC to help them do that. So. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Bill 13, you asked about, and I, I think I'm really encouraged in this conference hearing some of the challenges that people are having, specifically around bank accounts. Um, I think Bill 13, which is the Financial Innovation Act, is, will, be, will be really helpful to people as this rolls out. Uh, if things go according to plan, that act will become law this summer. Uh, and the, idea is to promote innovation in financial products. So it touches on a few of the existing laws in Alberta, the, the, finan the ATB Financial Act, the Credit Union Act, the Loan and Trust Companies Act. Um, these are acts that regulate financial services. So I, th I think that we will see innovation in, in the banking space um, once, once this comes into law. This act will create a regulatory sandbox uh, because what, one thing we've heard over and over is that innovative products often don't fit squarely within current 
existing legal frameworks. Uh, they don't, and so we, we use a regulatory sandbox approach where a participant in the sandbox can test something new, something innovative, a product or a service that doesn't fit squarely within those box, that box, and they can navigate that together with the regulator to figure it out as they go along. Um, this act will, it, it's basically an, an exemption program, but the exemptions are, the, the government will look at, okay, how do, we need to, how do we need to tweak what exists currently in order for this company to, to do what they need to do to test their, their innovative product? Um, there's a few upfront criteria that will be really important. The business must have a physical presence in Alberta. And this is something I think I've heard to, to, today and yesterday where, where companies are saying, you know, we're looking at relocating, we're looking at moving our head office to Alberta. We're, we're, we're really looking closely at that because we think Alberta has a very good and progressive approach toward regulation. So physical presence in Alberta, a detailed business plan with a description of what it is the business is trying to do, and also an exit plan. So you come into the sandbox, you, you test it, um, the regulator works with you to see how the law needs to be tweaked in order to allow you to do that, and then the business moves from that sandbox into the, the, the regular um, legal arena. So it, it's, it's a, I think it's very progressive for our government to, to look at doing this. Um, there's always this consideration of what's the net benefit to the public. Um, and of course, regulators are always concerned with making sure that protections are, in place. protections are in place. So there has to be reasonable consumer protections in place. The directors and officers have to be of good character and competence. So this is kind of the upfront information that the government will be looking at before they bring somebody into the sandbox. Now we have a sandbox in securities law um, that is it's different than this sandbox and there's been some confusion I think in some of the news articles. Um, this, this sandbox, Bill 13, is dealing with financial products so I, I think banking is going to be really touched by that. We have an existing sandbox in the securities law arena right now. Same thing where people are looking at securities law issues, their product, that what they're trying to do doesn't fit squarely, and same sort of process. We work with them to figure out what are the exemptions that are needed in order to allow them to develop what it is they, they, they're trying to do that benefits the public. That was a great introduction, and I think, Mark, you have maybe a few additional comments um, from uh, your vantage point as a, as a pioneer in the um, you know, blockchain space yourself. Um, this context, this uh, regulatory framework that we're talking about here, did that play in any way in uh, your, um, how could I call it, your <laughs> uh, adventure? No, it didn't, but it was helpful after the fact, I think, for creating an additional permission structure, not only for ourselves, but you know, for other charities or not-for-profit entities that are thinking about entering the space. You know, I think I mentioned this to some people yesterday, but you know, the Glen Rose is connected to Alberta Health Services. Alberta Health Services is the largest integrated provincial health system in the, in the country. And there's 70 health foundations connected to it that raise $250 million per year. And the number one question that every health foundation asks the HS is, how do we accept cryptocurrencies as donations? Because uh, govern government revenues are volatile, which charities, not-for-profits traditionally rely on extensively. Mm -hmm. The donor demographics are shifting, and so charities are rightfully looking for other financial alternatives. Um, and so, you know, for me, just taking a step back and thinking about whether it's uh, Bill 13, whether it's us entering the cryptocurrency space, us entering the metaverse, I always come back to the question of why, why you know? Uh, and we talked a lot about today money, technology, innovation and you know I, I always want to come back to like what is the base layer of why why do we innovate why do we innovate around blockchain and you know for me it's always about how do we optimize human potential and so when it's related to the Glen Rose it's like okay obviously money's important because it's a transaction of, of, of that value between two parties but you know why you know and so for me it's like optimizing human potential is at the base layer of everything Bill 13 
represents, everything this conference represents. Um, and I think we lose sight of that at our own peril. You know, if, if we're too hyper-focused on technological innovation, we're too focused on making money for money's sake, whether it's from a greed perspective, um, I think we lose the core of what blockchain, Bitcoin, really should represent is that optimizing human potential and ensuring that the individual can fulfill uh, their lives to their, their fullest wants. And so that's, you know, it's, 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 it's not a regulatory really, that, that, I, that's not really my space to really think about. These two are much more well versed to talk about that from a technical and legal perspective. But, you know, I think it's really important for everybody in this room when we leave today, it's like, what, what are we doing this for? Um, and so that's why, you know, us as a foundation and hopefully other charities really think through, you know, what it is that blockchain represents and what it can do for, for the individual. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Great to hear. <clears throat> uh, sorry. So, um, uh, Laurie, I'd like you to explain something to me. So why do projects issue tokens in the first place? I realize it's a basic question, but uh, it, it will be useful for me and hopefully for a few others in the room. And is it the case that tokens are always securities? I think that's a bit of a loaded question. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say thanks to everybody. It's been really fun coming to Alberta. A Toronto lawyer, I actually reached out to Kalea when I heard about this conference and I said, I want to come to Alberta. Everybody's talking about crypto over here. I should be speaking at your conference. And she was like, in Kalea fashion, she said, okay, lady, come on down. And that's how I'm here. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And I think on the question that you asked, which is why why are blockchain developers issuing tokens? What are they? Are they different from securities? Are they securities? I actually, and I, this is a little bit esoteric, but I kind of think it's going to something that you just said, which is maximizing human potential. Um, the concept behind decentralized networks is to really build global systems where the best people all over the world are working towards a common objective. And through technology, we are able to achieve that in a way that just wasn't possible. Um, you know, bef to, through, we've gone through web one, web two, and now we're moving to web three. And this, it's this idea of reconstructing the internet in this global decentralized way to allow more participation from more people that are the best at what they do all over the world. That is a super, um, you know, altruistic, high-level objective. And the reality is that on the ground, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of projects and pitches and tokens that are being marketed and promoted that are not doing those things. And so we have a challenge when we're trying to advise and regulate in the space of weeding out the, the legitimate projects that really are trying to trying to achieve those objectives and all of the noise that's out there in the market. And because everything is happening online and we can't see people face to face and do the kind of due diligence that happened in the traditional capital markets in the traditional world, it's really difficult to make those determinations and, and do that analysis. So getting to your question is, are tokens, what, what are tokens and are they securities? They're not supposed to be, and in the, the concept that I described of these decentralized networks that are globally connecting people, the token is supposed to be, I mean, the, the basic sort of currency token, I'm, I'm gonna leave aside governance tokens because I don't want to confuse people, but the, the token is supposed to be what a user needs to participate in the network. So it's instead of in the Web2 world when if you want to use Google or if you want to use Facebook, you basically have to accept the fact that you're being advertised to all the time, that your data is being taken and manipulated, and regardless of what protections are in place, you have to sort of accept the fact that there's a centralized controller of that experience and it's not you, the user. In a decentralized internet, users can choose the network that they want to participate on and they do that with a token. So you, the user, would go out and say, I want to participate on these networks. To do that, I need to buy these tokens. And so the token really is supposed to be this utility, this commodity that allows users to engage on networks. Um, and right, and, you know, and Bitcoin, I think, has certainly achieved that. And there are many other kind of Web3 projects that are either are there or on the way there. And the question of when a, when a network becomes 
sufficiently decentralized that the tokens that drive the network are truly commodities is the question that securities regulators are grappling with, you know, particularly in North America. Um, but that's the goal. And the token is not supposed to be a security. But the challenge is that until that level of decentralization has occurred, until the network or the protocol that is, you're using the token on is sufficiently decentralized that you can't identify one group or one person that's responsible for the network, then the token is security-like because the value of the token is tied to an identifiable group of others. And so every time we ask, is a token a security, you need to actually look at the project, at the protocol, or at the blockchain, and determine whether or not it's centralized or decentralized. And everything fluctuates so much that the answers could actually vary day to day, depending on the protocol, depending on who's engaged and participating. And also, and I'll stop in one minute, I, this is like just one more thought for you, and I'm sorry, I tend to start ranting on this. Um, because so many of the applications that are being built on blockchains also involve multiple layers. So you have the base layer network, you have one or two protocols built on top, and then uh, the whole structure from ground up all needs to be sufficiently decentralized in order to sort of eliminate or minimize the investor risks associated with the token. So it is extremely difficult to make that kind of determination um, of whether or not a token is at a point in time or not, excuse me, or not a security um, when, you're, when you're looking at it through that lens. Um, so that was a great explanation. Thank I you hope very that much. that was helpful. I know it gets kind of in the weeds, but I try to make it accessible. Happy to talk further with anybody after the session if that was too confusing. Thank you very much. And I wanted to turn to Tonya. And yeah. um, uh, in the prep room, we were talking about this weeding out that uh, Laurie just mentioned. Uh, that's also part of what the regulator does, right? And it helps the good actors that we weed out the bad, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on the, is it a security? This is, this, the, the answer, of course, is like, as you just said, it's not very satisfying because it depends. Like, you really are looking at what is the purpose of the token. Um, and capital markets love certainty. So this is an area that is really challenging for companies. And we get a lot of inquiries into, at the ASC where someone says, can you look at my token and tell me if it's a security? Because people know if it is a security, that is what the Alberta Securities Commission does, is we regulate securities, we protect investors, there are lots and lots of existing rules that you must comply with if you are trading securities. But at the commission, we don't do that analysis of is your token a security. It's, it's a little bit like you have to do your own taxes or hire someone to do your taxes, and then you submit that. And then Revenue Canada may disagree with you. They may come to a different conclusion. They may decide you owe more taxes than you thought you did. But you have to do the work yourself. And that is the same analysis that happens with, with tokens. Is it a security? So that is an analysis that typically you need to retain legal counsel for to do that analysis, to help you with that analysis. Um, and then the work that the ASC does and the, and the part that I can help you with is connecting the right people. If in fact it is a security, connecting you with the right people at the, at the ASC to get those registrations in place and trade compliantly. Um, but your, your, your point at just now is, yes, the ASC, I mean, part of our mandate is investor protection. So it is weeding out the good and the bad. And there are genuinely bad actors. And, and the, there's a lot right now, I mean, especially crypto is this area that's interesting. It's exciting. There's lots of online advertising. Um, there's this you know, fear of missing out that's happening. And it's an area that there's just so much fraud. Um, and, and so part of what the role of the Alberta Securities Commission is to bang those bad actors on the head because that really hurts the companies that are trying to do the right thing, um, that are just trying to navigate their way compliantly in this space. Mm. The advertising is something that struck me as well with the Super Bowl. How many, you know, Crypto.com and other FTX, you know, were, had mega advertising 
uh, or ads um, you know, during the show. Uh, Laurie, I'm going to go back to you, but ask for a short answer to the question, what's the difference between a token sale and a traditional equity raise? What are the, the nuances or maybe the... I, I'm going to keep it short, I promise, but I do thank you for asking that. Um, so the token sale is really how a project gets their tokens into, into the hands of, of others. And the way that token projects are trying to differentiate themselves from a typical securities offering is, again, the token itself is not intended to be an investment contract. The token itself is designed to be used to engage in a network. But until the network is fully developed, the, the sales of the tokens before their, the network is developed, before it's useful, those transactions are most likely investment contracts. And when you look at the way that investors buy tokens early on, they don't, it's not unusual that they would just buy the token. Typically, they're buying the a token warrant or a simple agreement for tokens or a token right that's tied to an equity investment. So it's a contract where the developers say, we're, you're going to give us some capital now. We're going to invest in building the network, building the project. And then later, once the project is ready to launch, we're going to deliver the tokens to you. And by then, the tokens are not going to be securities because they're going to be useful on the network. So we've seen a few iterations of that. With First, we had initial coin offerings. It didn't really work very well because it wasn't. Then we had the SAFT, which was like the two-stage transaction. And now you're seeing more um, of these token warrants and token rights that the venture capitalists are getting early on. Um, but the key to the, but those trades are trades and securities. And what, I, what we're trying to do, and, and I think the regulators and the securities lawyers, is to regulate those trades, make sure that they are complying with private placement rules, and, and helping the projects to determine when's the right time, when are we sufficiently decentralized, when can we push those tokens out so that, they're not, so that they are no longer securities. And in true Alberta fashion, I'm going to give you even more time before turning to the gentleman next to me and ask you, um, are we seeing a lot of security tokens uh, being sold via prospectuses or via private placement right now? If so, why or why not? Sure, I'll take that. And I don't think that there's a long answer because the answer is not a lot. <laughs> um, the reality is the security, so the security token is almost a, it's not actually a, a meaningful term because Securities are securities, and securities can take the form of digital tokens. You can have tokenized interests in property and other assets. Those would be security tokens. Or you could even have like an equity security that the issuer decides to make the record of those, to of those securities digital. Um, so those would be, you know, security tokens, classic, like what you would describe as a security token. But the idea of issuing tokens, the type of tokens that I described before, in compliance with securities laws is actually very difficult because the type of disclosure that an issuer needs to make in order to do a public offering of securities just doesn't apply to a digital token because there's no issuer. There's no financial statements. There's no management team. There, everything that you see when you read a prospectus that describes an equity security or even a fixed income security, most of that stuff doesn't apply to a token. And a lot of information about a digital token is open source, publicly available, and transparent. So the information asymmetry that the traditional prospectus was really designed to address I'm not saying that there, it's totally transparent, it's not, but there's a lot of information that is publicly available um, on places like GitHub and Etherscan that was not so in the context of traditional securities. Very useful answer. And uh, Tonya, as our regulator on the panel, do you have anything to add? You can say no. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Um, Mark, I'm going to turn to you and uh, shift gears a little bit and ask you to tell us a bit about the developments in the metaverse uh, and ask, will we see traditional equity and fiat fundraising in the metaverse? Um, yeah, and you're going to jump in too, and maybe you can jump in first. But I mean, yes, uh, again, this is from a charitable perspective. Uh, we're already seeing it now, and I think it's just going to continue to accelerate with further market adoption in the charitable sector. And 
you know, as a charity, you want to go to where the market will be, and you want to position yourself, particularly for us at the Glenrose, who's hyper focused on health technologies and innovation. It's, you know, this is a this is a monetary technology innovation, and as a foundation that raises money, um, it makes perfect sense for us to partner with a company like iMining, who knows the space technically very well, um, to create vehicles that can. Uh, raise money, market the hospital, have people better understand the value proposition the hospital provides to society, and then hopefully um, raise money through, you know, various different means like an NFT in, in the metaverse, which we're working on right now. So, you know, absolutely from the charitable perspective, it makes sense on, you know, several different fronts depending on, you know, how comfortable you are as a as an organization, how comfortable your board is, how much you understand the value proposition that exists today and will exist into the future, definitely. And Karim, as our entrepreneur on the panel. You know, and I'm so honored and blessed to be sitting next to my dear new friend, uh, Mark. And, you know, it's, um, it takes, uh, it, you know, Gandhi said a statement, I hope I get it right, but said, you know, only one man can make a change. And I think Mark is that one man who's really helped uh, uh, one of, a, a hospital of this stature enter the metaverse. And we've done some amazing work in just a few weeks. And, and just to explain to how I would explain to people who are financial oriented is, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, the metaverse being an opportunity uh, three times as large as the crypto industry, right? I mean, and I'm not the one saying it. Uh, you have the largest financial institution in the United States, JP Morgan, you've got one of the largest tech companies, Samsung, auction houses, Sotheby's, are all saying it and entering the metaverse. So they have spent a lot of time and resources figuring out uh, where the future is going. And just to give you an idea on extreme efficiency which exists in the metaverse, to just give you an idea of Decentraland, which most of you probably heard about. It's the most liquid cryptocurrency in the world. Maybe you didn't know that. It's listed on 187 exchanges around the world. There's no place on this earth where you cannot get access to MANA, which is the De Decentraland cryptocurrency. It has a market cap of almost $6 billion, and it rotates every 24 hours $1 billion. And it's got a Decentraland lands of only 92,000 plots of land in the entire metaverse of Decentraland, which were all sold out in 2017. So all these big brands are coming in, they're renting space from these landlords or uh, virtual properties who are going to become the future landlords. And these properties are gonna be worth so much more than even the real world. I mean, we were talking to some friends and you're talking about the metaverse being four times more valuable than real world stuff. I mean, Nike is predicting 24% of its income is going to come from selling digital shoes to digital avatars in the future. And it is happening right now. And if the charitable industry realizes how um, important it is to enter the metaverse, um, because you can do such great things. I mean, one of the things that we're so excited about um, at the Glen Rose is this nine-year-old boy, Liam, who's using a brain-computer interface, and uh, hopefully he will create a painting, which we will create an NFT. So you've just helped, uh, assisted a nine-year-old cerebral palsy patient at the Glen Rose into uh, a world-renowned NFT artist from just his brain power. And these technologies, and they are basically enablers. And it's not only about making money, and I, I, I love the, what Mark said, it's about how can we improve our efficiency and, uh, oh, going back on efficiency, on Decentraland is managed by a DAO. So DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's one of the top metaverse DAOs. And everything happens through voting. And uh, uh, what Lori was mentioning earlier was governance tokens. That's how the voting takes place, is if you own land, you get 2,000 votes. If you own a mana, which is $2 in some sense, you get one vote. And then you vote on everything. And the, and the DAO has a purse of $150 million that it's sitting on, which it gives out as grants and uh, different uh, activities to grow the ecosystem. 
In the first, I mean, this is historical. In the first time in history, this DAO, and there was voting of over $60 million of voting that went in to get the Glen Rose a $60,000 grant, which is going to get hopefully approved in the next two to three days when the voting ends. So if any one of you, even a zero vote would count because it's about the energy to show to even the metaverse community how uh, Glen Rose Hospital is um, increasing um, uh, the ecosystem. So I feel metaverse is um, uh, Hercules' heel in terms of Web 3.0 and um, uh, having the regulators and having uh, the, uh, the lawmakers understand that this is a potential of a lifetime. I mean, if we can make Alberta the Web 3.0 capital of the world, uh, uh, it, it will open up uh, the world's top talent coming to Alberta. Thank you. And that's a great segue to my next, sorry, Mark. Uh, no, I was just gonna add, I was just gonna add one more thing. Um, you know, because a lot of what Karam has talked to me about over the last month or so is, it's a bit, well, it's not, it's just mind bending to really think about. And so I try to relate it back to my own lived experience. And I was, I was obsessed with SimCity when I was a kid. And, you know, it's all I ever did was play SimCity on Super Nintendo. And, you know, I could only get 350,000 people in my, my city. And I could never get to 500,000, which was, I get the Super Mario statue to put in between my residential apartments. And, um, you know, so that was, 25 years ago um, and now my kids are playing on Roblox and they're always my daughter FaceTimed me last night she said, dad I need five bucks because I got to buy this cat from some other avatar and she traded me nine dogs for this cat I'm like I don't even know what you're talking about but I said just at least make sure it's actually another like nine-year-old not some like 50 year old fake account or anything like that but you know, so I think about the evolution of, of technology and how it impacted me when I was 10, you know, how it's impacting my daughters now, and as technology grows exponentially over time, you know, if you go to Decentraland now, um, it's evolving very quickly, but you know, two to five years, just think about you know, our kids, if they're between seven and, and 15, and how they're digital natives, you know, they were born on the internet. Well, they weren't born on the internet, but you know, guys know what I mean. I don't think anybody's been born on the internet yet. Not but, yet. Not, not yet. yet. <laughs> yes. But in Decentraland, anything's possible, they say. <laughs> Except for getting an actual shaved head, I have to get a George Costanza cone. And, I, and I'm still curious about the digital shoes. I'm still wondering if you'll still have to tie your laces or not. Yeah. That's another. <laughs> Anyways, my, my another point is, is that the potential, if you think five to ten years down the road, is really um, hard to even understand. All right, well, so you sort of set the stage as well for uh, the question around how do we make Alberta a hotbed of activity for crypto development, which I think everyone in this room wants. Um, uh, do, do we change the law? How can government assist in the process? Of course, it's great to see a, a provincial minister at a conference like this so early, relatively speaking, in this, uh, in this uh, industrial development. Um, and what about uh, the so-called safe harbor approach where projects are protected at an early stage of development. Maybe Tonya, you want to start with that? We have about yeah. five minutes. I mean, I think our government is already helping, um, and our laws are changing. So the, you know, Bill 13, that's new law that will come in. We're looking right now, the, the regulatory sandbox approach looks at how do we tweak existing laws. So the government is helping because I think they realize the incredible opportunity that it, that is available here. and that is so important to Alberta's economy. So yes, it's happening and you need a government that's committed to it and I, I think we have that. We have about three minutes left. Anyone wants to just comment on this? Because my next question is maybe the most important of all, which is what are predictions, your predictions for the future of blockchain uh, fundraising in Canada and beyond? So, um, so I, I mean, I just wouldn't like to add uh, what uh, Tony was saying is, uh, you know, it's about comfort level, right? And um, the uh, tech workers, uh, like the younger technology people who you talk to, and you're talking about late teens and early 20s. And, and they teach you so much because they, they understand it more than we do, right? We're still trying to figure out how, we, how can, can we monetize it? How can we make money out of it? These kids are living in it. They think it's a part of lifestyle on the way that they operate in, right? And in order to incentivize 
you got the the future or organizations gonna be cooler I mean there's gonna be a lot of recruitment problems people kids don't want to work for companies in the old-fashioned way and um, I mean and you can see that like Ernest and Young I was just told this morning has opened up their uh, first uh, career center in the metaverse to act cooler so that they can uh, hire uh, you know uh, more talent so I think uh, the opportunity in Alberta is it's uh, it's already cold, so we just got to become a slightly cooler, <laughs> and I think we can attract the world to Alberta and make it the greatest place on earth, uh, which it truly deserves. You had you had that pre you had that pre planned, didn't you? You just had to get that out. Cool, I had to get it. Out. I'm pretty sure the temperature will be controlled thank in you, the metaverse. <laughs> All right, so 30 the seconds can be each. anything you want in the metaverse, right? Yeah. 30 seconds each with one prediction because we have to go to Q&A and people are probably eager to ask a few questions. Who uh, Alberta's economy becomes the largest economy in the world in the next 10 years. <laughs> wow. I just think market adoption for this type of technology will continue at, at a pace that is really hard to understand. And I think regulations are a critical... Uh, a critical... Uh, continuation of that market adoption. Maybe uh, in my prediction, I also just want to touch on the last question as well about how can regulation help, and I think it's all related. But um, what what you were describing about the decentralized DAO, the decent the decentralized autonomous organization, DAOs are sort of my prediction, and I mean they said that 2021 was the year of the DAO. I actually think we're talking about the decade of the DAO because this is the decentralized organizational structure that sort of the blockchain developer community is, is looking for. And their need, what, what we're looking for as lawyers is a solution for creating a legal entity that makes sense for a DAO because operating without a legal entity structure exposes all of the members of a DAO to potentially unlimited liability. So if the question is how can Alberta lead, um, and I've been looking at different corporate statutes and related statutes across Canada, and there are some really interesting things that we can do here, particularly with our strong co-op culture, especially on the West Coast. Um, but looking at some of those laws that may just need to be tweaked in small ways to facilitate a uh, a legal entity DAO structure onshore so that we don't have to go to, not, not that there's anything wrong with Panama, my brother-in-law is actually from Panama, it's a great place, but a lot of investors, especially when we're talking about institutional investors, they're more comfortable with a more familiar onshore jurisdiction, so I think that that is, and that's what I find so exciting about working in Canada right now, is trying to uh, come up with those types of solutions. Panama is great. I was actually there in January and brought back the Panama variant of COVID. So I really highly <laughs> recommend going there just for that. It's really, really cool. Uh, Tanya, finally, predictions, please. Well, and it, it, the education that's needed in the regulatory space is happening. Um, there, I mean, there's tremendous investment, I think, in the province and even at the Alberta Securities Commission, our innovation team is about a month old. So we are kind of like a startup. Um, we're just figuring out what our mandate is, what it is we're doing, but there's a commitment internally to education and to understanding the space because of how important it is to our province. So you hear that, that a regulator is made to be felt like a startup thanks to the crypto, sort of the pace of crypto and all that. So that's pretty cool too. We have uh, some questions already. There was one up there. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is about liability for developers. So uh, like if you develop something, open source software, and uh, for example, it's used to create a security that uh, is perhaps fraudulent, right? Or they, it's edited to um, perhaps to a scam. Um, as the, a developer, but not like actually interacting with the project, would you have liability for that? And then the second question is about uh, creating tokens that provide value, say like Uniswap. Um, so like if you create a token and it provides value like right off the bat, but then you upgrade uh, the, the platform afterwards, um, could that be seen as a security? Thank you. I guess this is a question for me. Is it my, so the questions are similar and I think the answer is if all that a developer does is create open source software that runs autonomously on a blockchain, and that's all that the developer does. The developer doesn't seem to me to be involved in the issuance of a security. But 
If the developer also markets and promotes that software and the tokens that are generated by that software and also creates a user interface that's an easy way for users to engage with the software and acquire tokens and also deposit value into a smart contract that then becomes a treasury. All of that activity around the open source software is what gives rise to the securities regulatory risk. And in the second example that you gave with a Uniswap, and we know that the Uni governance tokens were initially airdropped and given away for free, which is great for a securities lawyer because if you don't raise any capital, it's a lot less likely to be a security. But then the question is, if then there are changes and upgrades made and the initial tokens are less valuable and new tokens come out and who is involved in that decision process? We talked about decentralized voting and the question is, is, it, is the project truly decentralized? Are there, are there a, still a core group of developers that are in control of the project? And also, are they building those front ends through which users are interacting with the open source software? Because it's all of those points of connection and centralization that sort of undermine the decentralized nature of the open source software and give rise to those liability risks that you're talking about. The gentleman with the blue uh, box. Cool. So, testing one, two, three. My question is one about uh, predicting valuation. So, how do we how do we make up for the fact that uh, things like Decentraland have such high valuations when they have uh, fairly limited user numbers? So, as an example, uh, the peak average concurrent users for Decentraland is 2,000 people at any given time. Whereas something like uh, SimCity, the modern version of it, City Skylines, right now has 18,000 people playing it. How do we assign such high values to things like Decentraland when they have a one-ninth of the user base of a fairly niche standard video game? How do we justify the land costs there um, if the things that drive those land costs would be eyes or users? I can take that. Look, yeah. No, this is exactly the discussion that we've had to have internally yeah. before a uh, public company has gone into, um, you know, um, investment in uh, the metaverse. And, you know, it comes back to the time uh, in 2010 when we would talk to people about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, my father's sitting over here. Uh, we own a bank in Kenya. And the chairman of the bank kicked me out of the office, who's my uncle. And, uh, and, so, and, and that was the same question then is, hey, how can Bitcoin be worth anything? It's 18 numbers, 100 million Satoshis make one Bitcoin. It can be transferred into. So, and it is worthless because all you got to do is play, plug in a computer and there you get these numbers. What is this number worth? So it's really the network. Mm. And the Decentraland network is very strong, not in terms of the amount of people using it, but the amount of people that hold the currency also. So you're talking about half, uh, about 300, 400,000 wallets individually that hold the mana token, and it fluctuates daily. Mm. So for, for someone who doesn't want to spend 40 or $50,000 entering you know, the crypto or the blockchain space through Bitcoin, and trust me, I've been the longest Bitcoin uh, maximalist there is, and all my friends. And the way I explain to them is, listen, there's only 300 million people in the world who use the blockchain space right now, right? And half of them happened last year. So you're talking about this is just the beginning. And through the metaverse, I think more and more, because the kids already know how to use it. You take an eight-year-old kid and put him in front of a Decentraland a laptop or a computer, hmm. she'll be or he'll be able to communicate in this. And you put a, a, a person from our board and it'll take a few days or a few weeks. For <laughs> someone from our board is back there. <laughs> so it takes a few days for them to even understand what, what is the, uh, anything happening. So I think the valuation, again, the, the quote of Wayne Gretzky, you know, uh, I think the metaverse, uh, the puck is, uh, it's not going, it's, the value is not you cannot justify value of what you know from the past um, because this is a complete uncharted waters, right? And the value, what's going to happen in the future, we think 
it's going to be four times more valuable than real life. So if Decentraland is only worth $6 billion right now, we think that's going to become $13 trillion or $15 trillion or $30 trillion in a matter of a year. So uh, the valuation is, is going to explode purely because the access or entry to Decentraland is so easy that anyone can do it. And the new generation, as they get older and older, and, and more jo older generation, you know, get, uh, get uh, etc. So uh, uh, it, it gets more and more, it's, it's going to explode, basically. I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure you own, share, you own tokens then, mana tokens, oh, yes. right? <laughs> oh, of course, I have. Can I do, I, can, can I do, you, can I, can I do you a solid? Please. Because I, I've listened to you butcher that Wayne Gretzky quote like yes, please. So, <laughs> much, so many times. I, I wrote that down for you. Okay. So you got you got to say it. So, so I'm not a hockey player yeah, either. Well, yeah, so no doubt. Understanding the analogy is amazing, right? So Wayne Gretzky said, "A good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be." So I really believe metaverse is the puck. Give Kram a round of applause for that quote. That's an amazing. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Any other questions? Uh, we have a couple minutes left. No? Well, then we're just going to take these couple of minutes and uh, enjoy them. So uh, a big uh, round of applause for uh, Tonya Fleming, Laura Steen, uh, Mark Courthouse, and Coram Shroff. Thank you very much.